Hey, what up? <laughs> how you doing, man? Good. How you doing, John? Good, good. Wow, it's you. <laughs> That's not how exciting. <laughs> yeah. I thought I'd keep you. Uh, I thought I'd keep you guessing yeah, until the last. Bad. <laughs> how you doing, man? I'm good. How you been keeping? Like in the last six months or so of quarantine. Uh, hanging, hanging in there. Um, you know the. Uh, um. I don't know when we're talking about maybe the next gig around um, uh, April Fool's in New York City, but man, I don't even think that's going to happen. You know, it's going to be a minute before a gig happens, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've been like continuously shifting my expectations about like when I can go somewhere, if I could go on a trip or even, you know, <laughs> go see a gig. I'd probably yeah. kill, I'd kill someone right now just to go to any, any crappy gig, to be honest with you, just to, just to mix it up a bit, but. There's, didn't uh didn't the uk just do a ban on over six uh people yeah yeah as of yesterday so Man. well you know you can go out you know like so you can all go to a bar or a restaurant but you can only have six people on a table but i could hang out with six people today oh all right and then go hang with another six people like tomorrow and it you know it's, so you it know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense not really no yeah yeah <laughs> What the about cases, you guys? Are you still like locked down in Detroit or sorry? Um, no, it's, it, it's, you know, we can still go out and about and stuff like that, but the students keep messing everything up. Um, you know, there's uh they keep having parties and all this stuff. I don't know if you heard about it, but over the summer there was a bar and like 300 cases got out of that. Um, so it's just the students that keep messing everything up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a bunch of like illegal raves here. Um, oh, really? <clears throat> yeah. But then I'm not, I, you know, it's the kind of thing where I don't know anything about it. So I hadn't actually been attending them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that keeps popping up and people having house parties and just trying to cram stuff in before like they probably do a full lockdown again. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, um, I took my mom in to see the doctor and I asked uh, the doctor what her uh, plan was, what her, um, what she think the winter was going to be, and she's going to be like, it's just going to be gnarly. It's just going to come back, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, yeah. I mean, this this is going to go on for a while, man. You know. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed uh, that gig goes ahead in April at least. Yeah. Um. At least, uh, you know, hopefully there'll be like a vaccine before the end of the year or something. But yeah, even that's risky. Yeah. yeah. So is that show the one that you guys had planned this year? In yeah, it was the, the New York Public Library archive one. Um, and we tried to, we talked about doing it for um, uh, for Halloween, but that, that's just not happening now at all. So April yeah. 1st is the new one, exactly a year when it was supposed to be. But, you know, we've only done two gigs this year. We did uh, uh, two gigs at Union Pool in January, and I did a Doberman gig, and that's it. You know, this is insane. Yeah, you know, we are losing our minds. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. So, what was yeah. the deal with that show? Like, wasn't it some you were gonna have like an instrument archive as well or something? Yeah, yeah, we got um, we got a guy rolled up to us uh, that worked for the public library, and he he was like, "Well, I want to do a, um, I want to do an archive with you guys for the public library," and we were like, "Oh man, that's amazing!" So the first thing we thought about doing was doing a. I don't know if you've heard about it, but they had the Grateful Dead tape wall. You know what I'm saying? No, but I'd seen a similar thing where it was a Sun Ra satin wall. Oh, wow. And had all like the original satin Tapes and kind stuff. of painted covers and shit. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah, there was a, uh, an artist guy that was doing a Grateful Dead wall. Uh, and it was, they were all dubbed and it was meant to be reproduced, you know? Um, I think it ended up being like $5 a tape or something like that, but it was like a thousand tapes. It was a big wall. So we were thinking about doing that, but we didn't really want to go uh, and track everyone down and get clearance and all this shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. we just recorded a new record uh, on old instruments. Um, and then we're working on like a, a, a library, like e-zine that has like an instrument description. And me and Nate painted um, uh, uh, fabric to go along with the exhibit and everything like that. So... You know, it's pretty much done, but we're doing the writing now. Like me and Nate started doing a, a history, a Wolf Eyes history. And, and, you know, within two weeks, it's at 50 pages and it's just <laughs> fucking ridiculous. Like, um, 
you know, we, we're concentrating on the crazy gym period right now, but I just started uh, a tour where we did Israel. Then that's taken all morning, just getting that one tour together. So we're, you know, we're just trying to write more, you know, it's good reflective time, you know. Is that going to be like a book as part of the exhibition then? We don't know. Um, it might be, uh, but we're not sure. Um, uh, you know, it's like super personal, you know, and it goes into everything. So it just keeps growing and growing. So, you know, it's been intense. Been yeah. a, been a healing thing. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been, um, we've been doing, uh, we got a, uh, set coming out box set for uh, seven inches in a wooden box uh, f additions of 50 and four of them so we got 16 singles wow. all ready to go so we've been working on that um, but we want to we want to put that out when uh, there's good news news president new president or a, you know vaccine or something like that you know it's just gnarly man you know yeah is that basically so, what you've been working on for the last one, six plus months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we, we've still still been rehearsing once a week, you know, and and all that stuff. It's just weird. We've never gone this long without a gig, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So, are, you, are you jamming, like, practicing like locally, or are you just doing it online? Uh, no, we go. I go practice with him, and then, you know, just practice at home. But, you know, it's been, mainly just been him and uh, me, you know, for – since uh pretty much this whole year you know, yeah so yeah um yeah it's been it's been weird you know so, so he's in like your social bubble kind of thing yeah. people you can you can hang with yeah yeah we've <laughs> seen that makes sense yeah yeah we've seen gretchen a couple times but um you know I, I see people at the skate park and all that stuff we actually they tried to shut down the skate park but we uh we just pulled the fences back and <laughs> You know, they got mad at us for like a week and then it stopped. So, but it's fine now. Um, That's cool. But, uh, you know, mainly I got to take care of my mom who's at an elderly home. And I'm, I'm you know, the most, the most stress is worrying that it'll yeah. attack that place. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, the, right by the skate park, I pass it every day. There's a, um, a Sears automotive center. They were, they, uh, they made into a, a COVID testing station drive through so, you know, there'll be weeks where it's just a couple of cars, but now it's like around the block, you know, so seeing the, seeing the pulse of the COVID is, is it's a good way to gauge it with that, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, but as it stands today, it was some of the longest lines I've ever seen. You know, the students are just fucking everything up, man. You know, <laughs> but how's your, uh, how's your lady doing? She's good. She's, uh, she's currently keeping the cat from running in here and attacking me during the course. <laughs> you think I'm entertained. Um, was, she, uh, was she a nurse or something, or if I remember correctly? No, no, she works uh, similar to me. Like we work in project management. Stuff, oh, all right. So, so we're just both working from home. You know, all right. For the last well, yeah, six months, I guess, and doesn't look like we're going back anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, and she was furloughed for a while too, <clears throat> but I've been kind of full time the whole time. So basically, oh, right. sat at this desk on other calls. <laughs> but not talking about music or anything like that, talking about boring <laughs> shit. So this is a nice change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it been uh, relationship style, being that close for six months? Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, we spend, you know, quite a lot of time together anyway. So Yeah, yeah. Like, if we hadn't already driven each other insane before this year, like, it probably wasn't going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Year. She's probably going to see this later and be like, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, it's been good. That's one like positive things like I've seen, you know, if a family was not going to be a part or a couple, it went by quick, but a lot of, a lot of couples are sticking it out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been good family time here, you know, and a lot of, a lot of people are getting stronger in that regard, you know? Yeah. The, the schools are closed, right? Yeah. 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 Um, both of them are working in the other room. Um, but you know, it's, uh, uh, that that being said, they went away to the East Coast for like a week and a half, and it was like amazing to have that much time alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess when it's twenty four seven, it's nice to get that downtime. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the the only real, I mean, it's you know, of course, it's negative, but the only real negative thing is I can't uh, because the neighborhood's so quiet. I can't, you know, pound away at this for hours on end. You know, usually I'm used to 
practicing while they're gone all afternoon, but you know, it's so quiet everywhere. It just kills the neighborhood, you know, yeah. blasting away. You know, there's someone who plays guitar and flute and you can hear like two blocks away. And it's just like, man, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I can't really, can't really read it out too much. Are they any good or do they suck? I mean, they're like, you know, pre like music band students. You know? Okay. Okay. Not like some guy yeah. shredding all night long or something. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, the overall volume in the neighborhood is quiet. Okay. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so other than like, obviously jamming and stuff, like with Nate, like, have you been listening to much new music? Obviously you've got your podcast now. Like, um, I meant, I, I meant, uh, to just listen to Michigan music for the full year and that's been going pretty good. Um, but in terms of new stuff, um, a lot of like hip hop stuff because the majority of the dudes I skate with are like SoundCloud beat makers and all that stuff. Um, so if I'm not up on that, man, like I'm, I'm an older dude hanging out, you know you what get, I'm saying? You get so, torn into. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, they got to mention, you know, like Boldy James or like some some stuff, uh, the Vincent guy from Chicago, like a, a bunch of hip hop stuff that I got to get up on, you know, just to hang. <laughs> you know, not to sound like a poser, but um, so, you know, a lot of that. And um, uh, at the house, like fall's coming around. So going back to the Pacific Jazz label stuff, you know, Bud Shank and all that stuff because yeah. it's the weather. You know, Michigan's really beautiful in the fall, and it's just starting to get there. That's um, but, uh, yeah, not not a whole lot of new stuff, like new noise bands. Like, man, I couldn't tell you a damn thing about any of them, <laughs> you know. Like, this whole, the whole, like, free band camp thing is, uh, it's just, I don't know, you know. That's why we did the vinyl, because we're like, so many people are doing this. No one's putting records out. You know, let's lean on it while we, you know, while we can. We, tr we tried out a new press. Yeah. Uh, Germany and it turned out real good. So, uh, you know, band camp and all that and Zoom stuff, like, it's, I don't know how permanent that is, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's cool and it's getting people by, but personally it's, uh, you know, trying to stay away from all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I've picked up a bunch of stuff off band camp because, you know, because there's some interesting stuff that you can't get hold of, mm -hmm. you know, any other format. So it's good to get it and at least the money's going to the artist, but I'll be honest, I, I bought loads of stuff and then just not listened to it because <laughs> I don't scroll through files on, on a laptop or on like a, you know, an iPod or something to put it on. Like, I, it, it just doesn't, I don't flick through and go, oh man, I gotta listen to that. Like, oh, I haven't heard that in ages. It's like a tiny little, you know, icon. So it's good, but yeah, I'll be honest, like I probably listened to maximum of half of what I bought in that time mm -hmm. it's still much rather get you know a physical copy or something because you know i'm gonna look through the rack and find it yeah that's that's more fun too yeah yeah yep yeah. and it's uh you know in terms of like collector mentality and stuff like that i mean you can't really that doesn't really scratch the band camp uh itch you know <laughs> what i'm saying you can't really brag about your zip drive full of <laughs> band camp things and when yeah. people are like, this is what I bought on Bandcamp Friday, it's just like, oh, man, like, it's just not very appealing, you know? Yeah, come check out my MP3 collection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my Wave collection. Oh, no, it's got to be Flack, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think it all the oh, man. Differences. God, how annoying is it, Flack? God. I, don't, I, I, can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've had to log into Flack to MP3, you know? I never it. managed to play one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a clue. What's uh what's Neil Young's thing? Uh, his his audio Pon file. Pono, pa Pono or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they yeah. shut it down after. Like, oh, they did. Yeah, yeah, that's dead now. Why? Because no one bought into it. I think. <laughs> and I, I think he couldn't get any like artists on it because most of them are like licensed to maybe like Apple Store or Spotify or something, mm -hmm. and there's nobody signed up to it. Oh wow! I think Didn't it was I, pricey it, too. Didn't Jay Z uh, try to do a new platform or something like that too? Yeah, I don't know what it's called. But then yeah. you also had Justin Timberlake bought like MySpace. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> For like a million dollars, what a bargain that is! Huh? <laughs> Jeez. 
Jesus. So you never know, it might come back. It might, you might need to start uploading your archive <laughs> onto MySpace again. <laughs> me, and, me and Nate had a, a joke that we would pull when we, when we were hanging with someone that was super gullible. We'd be like, oh, um, what's his name from Devo? Bought all the old band uh, stuff from Bandcamp and turned them into real life. Or what was it, Second Life? Oh, so that, yeah, yeah. So that they all still exist on Second Life, every single band <laughs> and everything like that. Like you could go to a gig and and uh, adjust, like make a little tour of all these bands, like on Second Life of bands that were on MySpace, you know? People just believe the shit out of that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, though, at the moment, given the lack of gigs, I, you know, I've never been on Second Life, but I might give it a go if it was there right now. I mean, it, was, it was hot for a minute, you know? Yeah, but it'd be like virtually going out except for a change and seeing something. But <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, probably not. Yeah. That's like some Black Mirror stuff right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started doing this page, like posting your pictures. Obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because, thanks for that. Great. Because I got to a point a year ago where I was like, I've got too much stuff. You know, I'd be like I went through that collector mentality thing. Like, I got way too much shit, man. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to listen to this, like all of it, not just you know your stuff, but anything really. Yeah. And I was thinking, like, you know, I'm going to drown in <laughs> tapes or records. Yeah. I'm like, fuck it. I need to set a challenge where at least I'll listen to one thing a day of, oh, a, right. of a particular style. Yeah, yeah. And at least then I'll feel like I like <laughs> achieved something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's no, been quite good, good to... Uh, that's a good discipline to do anyway, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to confess, though, I've cheated some days, like... Yeah, that's fine, man. Because I had to I sort of write a review, you know, which is not particularly <laughs> good. And the cheat days, the cheat days are kind of obvious. Uh, <laughs> because it, I, if I found your, you know, like, press release type thing of your song, uh -huh. I just copy-pasted it. That was like, cool. <laughs> I don't need to think of anything because you did it for me like 10 years ago. The other thing was... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, well, the other thing is like, you know, cheat days would occasionally be if I was like, you know, feeling a little bit ropey in the morning from a, <laughs> from a night out. And I thought, man, there's no way I want to listen to that Wave CD today. Like, that's, today's not the day, you know. Like, so, like yeah, I'll pass. And I just like copy paste it. But <laughs> That's cool, man. Yeah. Waking, yeah. up, wake, waking up and dealing with waves, man. Wouldn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever actually said to you that they've, like, listened to all of it? Um, all, all the way through? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's been a couple, you know. Um, but um, I tried to – I think I did, like, four waves gigs. Um, one – the one that was really successful was in my basement uh, when me and Toba lived in Jerome Street right down the way. And that was just hell on earth, you know what I'm saying? But not like, not like Kevin Drum hell, where it's like distortion, yada yada. It's like like tone hell. Yeah, you know? it cuts right through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was it all it all comes from um, Nate had a I had a drum machine that he altered really early on around the Joel era that had a knob uh, like a death switch that you turn it up uh, and it would just it would just annihilate every single thing. It was like, you know, you're, you're jamming at 10 and then you hit the knob and it's like 30, you know, it was always, always incredible. Mm. And, um, you know, it's kind of rare to find that on a machine. So rewiring the mixers and stuff like that, if you hardwire everything based around the gain and the treble, that, that way you can get that tone, you yeah. know? Um, so everything is just already starting in hell and then you just go from there, you know? And then you EQ it, so it's you know you get it sounds like you get shit in your ear and stuff like that. So yeah, <laughs> it just kind of went straight through my head and made, me, and made me feel like really disorientated. Like I couldn't, almost like I couldn't walk straight. Like if I got up and walked around, I'd be like, now what's going on? Yeah. Like being punched in the face. But like <laughs> anything loud and bassy is fine. You know, you can feel it, and it's like I can deal with that. But shrill tones, like. <laughs> It's not fun. I'm guessing you don't have a dog or anything when, when you were jamming. Because um, they probably bolt out the room. I mean, the best the best place to listen to it is in the car, you know, where you can really get the, the stereo thing and no one's around. I mean, Tova hates that more than anything, you know. She's got a release called Me and Waves Don't Get Along. Don't get along. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 
she she doesn't really uh, say too much about jam. She hates Finnish, hard, hardcore, um, and Italian. She totally hates. She doesn't like hardcore in general, but you know whatever. Uh, who does? You know anyway. <laughs> And um, Wave, she didn't really like. And uh, I'll, I'll go through a long stretch of playing Christian stuff, and that'll drive her through the fucking roof, you know? Really? I, yeah, can, kinda, I can kind of see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it'll be like a, a sermon on the blood of Christ from something from Mount Pleasant in the 70s, and she'll just be like, my God, like, turn this shit off, you know? Yeah. And I'll, I'll, like, I'll come back from this uh, skate session totally stoned, you know, from the boys, because everyone at the park just blows, like, the most highest grade, because half of them are, you know, it's legal here, so half of them are, you know, delivery cats, so it's just everywhere, dabs, there. it's just insane, so I'll come back, and I'll throw on some serious, gnarly local Christian stuff, and it's just, that's psychedelic, man, you know, yeah. it's so raw, and, like, unrock and roll, and unsexy, it's, it's incredible, man, <laughs> you know, like, when you're stoned, that's, like, like, insane, you know, or like a, like a um, CL uh, Franklin's, uh, uh, Aretha Franklin's dad was a sermon and ch uh, pastor and uh, Je uh, Chess put out 53 sermons on record and he, you know, they're already aggressive, but he ends up like singing as it goes on. It just gets more in a fervor and those are just incredible, you know, and, and you, you know, you got, they're separated uh, by almost five miles you know you get a, a white uh jack van empey uh sermon talking you know they're super paranoid and you know gnarly and then you get you know more gospel stuff further down south michigan you know the woodward even mm. you know and it's just a world of difference and that kind of stuff is just you know f figuring out how those two could coexist in the same state just drives me insane you know it's like the uk you know you go two blocks and it's a different uh accent you know it, it's it's interesting you can't take that shit for granted because eventually that'll be gone you know yeah yeah the like cockney's gonna be gone you know well technically you're supposed to be born near within earshot of the, of bow. the bells yeah in bow yeah. but because they're now like surrounded by like high-rise towers oh, you yeah. can't really hear them anywhere other than like down that one street because all the sounds <laughs> just kind of like stuck within these streets and ringing around so yeah yeah if you're if you're gonna split hairs you know and say that's a cockney then there's probably none <laughs> 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 there's probably none but then obviously you still get the guys who are like proper cockneys who you know which is just insane language like hardcore yeah. east londoners so you you spent some time in okinawa right like yeah you kid. yeah Isn't my it? uh um uh, my dad was a marine general uh, and we were stationed there 80 to 85. Uh, wow. And um, yeah, that was super intense. I didn't get off the island once. Small little fucker. Yeah. Did you guys end up going there when you went no, to Japan? No, yeah. we, didn't, we didn't get to go this year because of like everything shutting down. So we didn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I know you were telling me about the, the snakes. Oh, the habu snakes. Yeah. yeah. There was so much crazy stuff there. I mean, like, um, you know, they, they bite anything with heat. So you, if you get to the point where you even see one, you're, you're going to be smoked and you die like within less than a minute, you know, and yeah. they got the sea snakes in the water. And, but the worst is they got, um, it, you know, we, we would be in a military base and, you know, it would only, you could only go off base uh, from like eight in the morning until seven. You couldn't come and go off base. They would actually shut it down, you know, and we, we would have the enlisted people on top in the, um, the unlisted people at the bottom of the big hill, you know. Um, so we were living around by the, the, you know, brigadier generals and all that stuff. And um, around the bases, there were uh, boonies with bamboos, you know, bamboo fields. Yeah. And there'd be old booby traps from the war that once a month, some kid would go and blow his arm off, you know. And there would be people stuck in the Okinawans, stuck in the... the uh, bamboo that still thought it was the war you know so it was just crazy shit all around man it was just a you know, banana spiders and geckos and all this crazy shit it was insane to live there you know and there was no communication whatsoever i mean you'd send a letter you know in 80 and it would take six months to get there you know people would 
would come from the states and you'd be like what's the new thing and people would be like oh there's this tv show called night rider and it's about a car that talks and we'd be like oh, oh. or there oh there's bubble gum that's in like a um uh like a toothpaste tube so you squeeze it and you'd be like oh, oh how does it exist you know crazy shit uh when return of the jedi came out the only way we could see it was on beta and it was just the lower half like this much of the screen <laughs> So that's the only thing we could watch for years. You so just the legs. Just the legs, and the top part was just static on beta. <laughs> um, so when we finally saw it, we were like kind of let down because uh, everyone was like had their imagination about it, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, like movies wouldn't come there. Nothing would come there. They would. They wouldn't even have commercials. So when you would watch TV, where there would be a commercial, it'd just be black square, or it would be a. a, a a military commercial about wear your helmet and there it'd be like low tech commercials where a helmet would go filled with like blood and it'd be like don't have your helmet be a brain you know brain bucket you know and the worst like really gnarly commercials that would just be erratic like every other fourth commercial thing versus just black and the worst one i will remember this one it just chilled me to the bone it was uh you know uh, a bunch of kids jumping in a lake and then a kid jumps in and the other kids just go look at the lake and it's just like smooth and they're like always check the temperature jump in water oh. but the kids like looking at the water and like the kids not coming you know what i'm saying it's fucking gnarly man we're super intense you know yeah it's just gnarly man <laughs> it's a good era sorry the sound went a bit crazy that's yeah. i think the idea of it would be like all going black and then you get in a single ad is almost more terrifying it's like yeah yeah you're nice and calm like, okay it's just black and then all of a sudden you get this thing like don't go yeah, outside you, or you will don't get don't have your head be a brain bucket you know <laughs> just so not chill um because you know the military the the majority of the people there were just young military guys, you know, so they would just go off and act crazy. You yeah. Know? So a lot of, a lot of don't do this, don't do that. Why haven't you used that as a title? Don't let your brain, don't, what is it? Don't, <laughs> don't let your it, helmet be a brain bucket. I think it's too close to like bucket of blood or something. Okay. Like that. okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Fair enough. And you can't, you can't have it be like a, a, a total reference. Like, um, you know, there's like all the uh, cherry point stuff, how it's so movie, you know, Rita and all that stuff. It's so exactly like a movie, you know, yeah. or a direct movie thing. It's just like, come on, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, give me a, you know, where's the foreplay, you know? Like, <laughs> seduce a player a little bit. Like, I, I get it. You're into horror movies. Whoa, I'm a slasher. Ugh. You know, it's like. It's like, what, did you, did you, did you not get enough attention from your mom when you were a kid or something like that? Like, whoa, I'm so tough, you know? <laughs> these people at a gig, they ain't tough, you know what I'm saying? Like, whatever, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, having the title allude some type of mystery is, is better than, you know, Bucket of Blood or, you know, ooh, that movie was intense, you know? Yeah, yeah, I get you. But then you've got, like, a few titles that are, like, plays – Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh yeah, yeah, plays, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, that's that that's a good point uh, because we would, uh, Tove and I or whoever, you know, we'd be watching something and we'd be like, "That's a really good soundtrack. Let's re let's do something with it." You know, I think the very first one was the Boogeyman. Um, so, but but that still references that has a verb in it, so you're doing something with it rather so than, yeah. Are rather you actually than taking having, the source material then and like? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Just using it as a as a basis because you know a lot of those were just you know early synth stuff that sound really good when you mess with them. You know. Yeah. yeah. But um, just referencing an obscure horror movie is like a secret bro handshake rather than <laughs> a tool for like invention. You know. Yeah, I get you. It's just I don't know, man. The slasher stuff. I, I'm just not into it, man. Like if you've ever been cut or if you've ever been beat up or like you know aggressively taken over like none of that shit's chill you know yeah. or had a fucking strap pointed at you like uh, ain't nobody want ain't nobody got time for that you yeah, know? yeah that's just trying to impose about how tough you are and that <laughs> it is never convincing to anyone you know 
I just suck at titles, but not, but rather than come up, like just steal a title, I would just put it untitled because I can't be bothered to think of anything. <laughs> well, I mean, co- go ahead. I was going to say, I can't come up with anything, you know, that seems to fit or just doesn't sound pretentious. So it's like, fuck it, I'm just not going to bother. <laughs> like, I can't be bothered with that. Well, that's, uh, that's interesting because in your collages, you don't use text. No, not for a really long time. I did for a while, but like, don't know how many years back, but yeah, I stopped doing that. Mm-hmm. Just because I'm not a wordsmith. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my forte at all. So I just thought I won't bother. I'll just focus on the visual thing. Like, Well, I mean, you, you found your goal with the zines, you know? Have you have you been uh, holding steady with the same printer for a while? Mm, yeah, for the most part. Um, I switched up a few years ago just because they got like really expensive, but I just stuck with the same company. They're, they're uh-huh. pretty good. They're always quick. I think they got used to me complaining about stuff, and they were like, okay, we know he's going to complain about <laughs> X or Y, so we'll just make sure we don't do it this time. And what, yeah, What's so. the main complaint? Like the black, the amount of black? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. It comes out like smeary or... Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a little rubby. Yeah, uh-huh. like the, like it got caught in the printer and the, and the ink's kind of smeared as it's coming yeah, out. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it doesn't have the, the fin. it didn't go through the proper amount of finishing or the, the heat temperature. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Like I, I used to work at Kinko's for the longest and, and, you know, dealing with all that stuff was cool, you know. Is that how you printed up all your covers? Did you? Oh, pretty for the longest time. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was a great job, and I would give. Uh, it was when you could do the cards with the money, so I could just give people cards with you know two hundred bucks worth of copies in them and stuff like that. It was just put the number in and do the card. It had no money value whatsoever, you know. So people would come through. Delaware would come through or something like that, you know, just do it. So it was cool, you know. Because back the then, it would, it would, you would have to cut it up and enlarge it and blow it out and all that stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. So you would bring your stuff to the cop, cop, copy shop and design it there. You know, that was the kind of style. So it was like a real social place. You'd meet a bunch of freaks, you know. Yeah. That was, uh, that's, that doesn't really happen too much anymore. Cut copy shops, you know. Yeah, this is like a prince's, you know, it's like on a, industrial estate in another town so i don't even see them really really <clears throat> i only talk to them on the phone or something like that yeah uh-huh. they wouldn't be doing like copy shops around here are more like for photos you know right. or, or like just yeah straight up xeroxing type stuff so it's not yeah. like, it's not bad quality but it's not great either it's really just you know print out your documents or something like that yeah yeah like fax style exactly yeah it's like one of those big chunky fax machine type things yeah yeah Yeah. we have uh we uh msu the university has a resale place and occasionally they'll they'll sell like a 40 dollar copy machine and you get stoked and then you you do it for like a week and then like it jams and there's not a a damn thing you can do with it you know (laughs) (laughs) and by that point you bought like you know 200 bucks worth of antique toner that you found on ebay and it's yeah yeah so like some of your obviously you do stuff from the coffee shop and stuff but like your early early stuff was more like sort of sculptures and and things like that right like where would you get the the materials for that stuff i worked at a um i worked at an antique store with a um and a retired uh sociology professor named Spud, Spud Morrison, him and his wife, Bonnie, they, uh, he got in a really bad accident. He got hit by a drunk driver. So it was like a, an elderly cat. Um, so I, I, I started helping them at their house and then eventually they, uh, integrated me into their, uh, antique shop. And, uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> where I got a lot of the materials and I would just let them, uh, you know, got for a while where he would just come in once a day. So it was just me. So I'd be posted up listening to like pain jerk tapes and like letting this stuff dry for like weeks on end. You know, it was amazing. Um, and he would, he would give me saxophones cause he was a big garage sailor back in the day. That's how you'd find all that stuff. So he would come, uh, almost once a week with a new instrument, you know, to just be like, here, check it out. You know, I got this for whatever, you know, just try it out. So that was cool. And, um, you know, that, that was when I was dealing with uh, Bentley Welcomes Careful Drivers and all those cats, you know, so it was, it was a good era, 
Um, yeah. And in that shop, I met uh, Johnny Cash. They, they were playing at MSU. And him and June came through because they're big antique place on a rainy day. Uh, and the tour bus came through. So she came through and then he came through and I, I met him. And I think I was playing like MSBR or something like that. <laughs> um, Did he come in? <laughs> yeah, he came in. It was just him. Uh, and he looked around and I said, hi. Uh, you know, I didn't make a big deal out of it. Uh, but his vibe was insane. You know, it was like fucking super intense. <laughs> just tiny guy, real small, you know, but real like just brooding nuts. I got it. I just seems like the kind of guy you wouldn't want to piss off. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he seemed nice, but he just seemed really kind of otherworldly, you know? Yeah. And I love, I love early Sun records. I just love more than anything. You know, it's really, really good stuff. I wish it was from Michigan, you know? Yeah. Um, it's kind of weird because I was looking at, um, I was looking at a tape that I had down here. It sounds like some kind of radio show the way I sort of intro that. But it actually, I was, I was weirdly <laughs> looking at it and it had a thank you in it. Uh, and Spud is listed on there. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I was like, well, who's Spud? So now I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Spud Morrison. Um, he uh, and he would, um, we did a lot where we would paint. He was really into Frank Lloyd Light stuff, Frank Lloyd Wright stuff. So we would paint chairs uh, and furniture and music stands in Frank Lloyd Wright style. Yeah. So I must have done about, I don't know, 200 of those uh, that were sold. Um, he would, you know, I had, I had a little spot in the workroom and would just paint all day and we'd sell them, you know, so it was cool. And, uh, I had a really good relationship with them, uh, for the longest, you know, they never had a son. So they, they always said that I was like their surrogate son, you know, so it was a really good, uh, really good era. Did um, you give him, did you give him any of your finished like pieces, or tapes or anything with all the packaging? Um, <laughs> was he into that or not so much no no i did a, i had an art show once in town and he went to that and he thought it was cool but um he uh yeah it would have been too weird for him you know <laughs> uh he was a real he taught me how to bargain and how to talk people down and how to not be talked down with prices so he taught taught me a lot about negotiation you know because antique stores the first thing people are going to do yeah is uh try to talk you down and uh, he showed me the, the easiest way to do that is to not do anything. So, like, I'm like, hey, man, like, let me buy that book from you. Uh, how's 12 bucks work? And then you just, you just, you know, just do this. You know, just look at them for as long as possible. And then you just wait until they break from the tension. And then usually that just, then they come up with the price that they want to do. You know what I'm saying? Does that work on so, Discogs as well? What's that? Does that work on Discogs? <laughs> Kinda, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was good. You know, it was a really good skill to learn. You know, negotiating price because we got to do that all the time with, uh, you know, fees and yada yeah. yada club stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so it was just great. I love the guy. He was amazing. Uh, he died not too long ago, uh, but I'm still in contact with his wife now and then, Bonnie. Um, that's cool. So it was it was great. Yeah. Um, so you're doing the kind of crazy packaging a bit more now, right? Like there was some stuff. Oh yeah. Me yeah. Memory passages or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, patterns for lost memory. Yeah, I saw it for um, like ten seconds appear yeah. and then it's gone again. So. <laughs> well, it was. Um, it wasn't me that bought them. So. Just <laughs> say. Um, it uh, well, it's it's kind of twofold because, um, you know, uh, nine times out of ten. The only thing we can do, uh, besides me running quick errands, uh, is to go for multiple walks around the neighborhood. Yeah. You know? uh, we, we usually do three a day. Um, so I'll find like a mushroom or like a hubcap or something like that. I'll find an object or uh, a piece of construction stuff that looks like it was an old American Dave thing or something like that. Yeah. So I'll just... I'll just be like, oh, I'm not going to find two of these. I'll just do one master tape style, you know, influenced by Nate's war zone label. Nate had a label uh, early 2000s called war zone where he would just, someone would give him a master and he would just give the master to someone else. <laughs> just trade it alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so there was never multiple copies of this. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of, um, I talked to a guy who was doing a Canadian guy, I forget the name of a book, but he's doing a book on, special packaging 
and he he turned him and a guy named Ed Stack turned me on to a, a bunch of labels that would put out a bottle of wine as a tape release or <laughs> or a walk. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like pretty pretty super close to Fluxus kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? Uh, so that kind of reinvigorated into it. Um, uh, so, you know, I've been doing more of that. And it's, you know, my mom has uh, Alzheimer's and, you know, I'm her power of attorney. So I got to deal with all the stuff with her. And, and, you know, it's been really hard dealing with her uh, and seeing her decline, you know, because she's perfectly healthy. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's gnarly and, you know, my dad has mental problems uh, and I got tested for Alzheimer's and it's, you know, I'm, that's, that's my future I'm going to be looking at. So I'm like, man, I might as well start a project, you know, referencing memory loss. You yeah. Know? So it's a way of uh, kind of controlling uh, a future or at least documenting that, that that's uh, on my mind, you know, because uh, it's, it's gnarly. You know, Toba's on me all the time about being aware of it you know, and hopefully some medication comes uh, around of it. But, you know, I don't know if you've ever dealt with anyone with Alzheimer's, but it's, it's fucking, a, it's a slow burn, man. Yeah. You know? No, and I haven't, but I can imagine it's It's, uh, you know, my, mom, my mom taught me music and she's, you know, she's amazing uh, in a, a lot of ways, you know, and uh, so that's just a new thing to reference, you know, like I love titles, like sometimes you just need a title and then everything just falls into place, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of people can't really listen to stuff. So the last thing, the thing that's going to last more is the title, you know? So I've always, I've always loved titles and given, you know, writing you're down something you're here, like, um, thank you, Urindal, um, is an early release. And we were driving back from a party at like five in the morning. And, uh, my friend, Deb, Deb Travis was like, uh, hand me a glass of water. And I was in the back seat and I handed it to her. And she said, thank you, you're a doll. And I thought she said, thank you, you're a doll. And I was like, oh, man, that's a killer title, you know. And Tova will hear something and be like, you know, you got to use that for a title. You know what I'm saying? So titles are great, you know. It's like condensed poetry, but you can – it it involves like an, a, an experience, you know. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes the title will give you everything you need to know, you know, for about the release or or the band name or something like that, you know. There, so, and that's me saying everything I do is untitled. <laughs> <laughs> well i, I don't I, you know it, it's it works for some people you know like some cats uh just use their name for a jam like i i personally don't like doing that so much you know i think it's kind of a missed opportunity um you know it's music man it's like it should be its own world mm. you know it should be a gateway into escapism you know there's fucking realities everywhere you know what i'm saying like if, if you can alter your reality to something else, it's you're halfway there, you know? And I, I think, uh, you know, it's not sick of it all. It's not like the crow mags, you know, you don't want to be hit over the head about how real life is, you know, <laughs> nonstop, you know, yeah. and it's, it's abstract music. So take it and run with it. You yeah. know, it's yours, you know, it's clay, you know? So I think the more arbitrary and the more abstract things are, it's, it's, you know, it's better for the title and, the long, you know, longevity of it. You so know? would you, would you come up with the title first and then try and work around that, or would it be the other way around and you'd have something and be like, oh, I'm going to name it, whatever it was, you know. Whatever um, it kind of, it, it kind of goes. Um, I'll, I'll keep like, you know, I got like a sketchbook. Um, got them up there, and I'll, I'll write. Uh, 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 you know, I, I read a lot of sci-fi, so I'll read like a, a sentence, you know, and I know piece it together or something like that um but if i'm recording something uh i'll listen to it uh you know numerous times until a, a title or a, a band name comes through that you know like uh l ron um what uh bilbo l ron and me that's yeah. that's from a misheard thing from a gandalf the gray record yeah. and would you pick like was a band name connected to something like that you know the gear you were using or something or was it just i'm gonna i'm gonna call this a spikes one i'm gonna call it a, whichever um, band you chose well it uh um it I, I guess it all kind of depends like um you know you want it to be based upon the sound so much and the equipment you know if it's got a horn or if it's acoustic 
and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, th I think about a time that was really fun. Um, uh, side note on the titles and stuff like that. Um, there was a bar in Ann Arbor, a uh, real shitty chain called Bar Louie. And it was right next to uh, the record store in Ann Arbor. Um, got it on Encore, Encore Records. And this is when everybody, this is when everybody was living uh, in Ipsy and Ann Arbor. And, uh, you know, Gray was living there. Conley was living there. Everyone was living there. Dillaway, yada, yada. Nate, everyone. And, um, we, the, you know, we would go and we would sell stuff to Encore. And then someone found out that the bar had a happy hour from noon to two, uh, four at Bar Louie. So it was on Tuesday. It was buy one, get one free and all this shit, you know. So it turned into Bruise Day. So we would go and we would meet uh, from 12 to four and the bills would be like 4,000 bucks, man. Like we would, we would, I mean, Delaware would bring his kid. It was gnarly leaving from that thing, man. And uh, it would be like, the bill would come down and it'd be like 17 PayPal cards, you know, and, and people would bring bags of like, oh, here's a new tape or here's this, here's, you left this at a gig yada yada so anyway from like that got that got to the point where it'd be like 30 people you know and 30 people would be like hive mind raven string uh charlie draham um all these new cats that were start dan haunted dan all these people uh and it was just like a it was like a you know really fertile field of tape you know people just doing stuff and you know there'd be a gig uh that night or the weekend you know any of that so anyway after doing bruise day for like a year um, we came up with the idea of let's do weighted ghost. Uh, let's show up with master tapes and switch them and use them all under this title. So no one knows what the fuck is anything. You know what I'm saying? And weighted ghost came from, um, when you quote someone postage and you get it wrong, like, Oh, that'll be 20 bucks. And you end up send, sell, uh, sell, sending it. And it's like, you know, 80 bucks. So yeah. you got to eat it. You know what I'm saying? So it's like a fucking weighted ghost. I've been there. So, that's where, so that's where that came from. So for an era there, like what hive mind thing was weighted ghost was really like Conley and like Dillaway did one. And it was like Charlie Draham. And it was like, it was just utter confusion. We were like, man, let's just screw it up as much as possible and see if anyone notices or just to <laughs> screw it up, you know? So that was, that was fun, man. You know, there's a whole bunch of that going on at that time we would we would have bars that we would just like take over like uh we had banfields east um which i think a couple of titles are from and it had a back room and we would just go there and um we would leave merch like we would show up again and people would be like oh here's this bag that you left there um you know we would uh uh the the bills would just be ridiculous like the beer bills it would just be like you know and when the bills would come around all of a sudden be a, a bunch of cats would leave you know what i'm saying so it was it was cool we would just you know it was like a really intense group you know um but the, did the bar staff like you yeah absolutely because <laughs> we were good tippers and we were always there we weren't a problem okay. Okay. You know, we would like we would like, you know, tip over a pinball machine or break a trophy or it was like just dumb shit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it was, it was fun. It was a good era. You know, it was just really, uh, um, the amount of drinking going on. I mean, Midwestern people just drink like no tomorrow. And so it was like, you know, thankfully no one got hurt, um, or iced anyone, you know, driving and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, yeah. we kept it, we kept it pretty cool. So for something like Brian Ramirez mentioned to me ages ago when he was pinging you, was that there, so when did like you started the label in 95? No, um, actually, um, we, me, me and my friend Jim, uh, Jeff Dunn. We, oh, sorry. I didn't mean with him, by the way. I just meant, oh, with so, Ramirez. Well, it, it went in three, it went in like three, it went in two eras before it, it hit the ground. Um, okay. There was the me and Jeff era, which we drove back from seeing the Blue Humans um, and all that stuff. A, a new uh, New York, uh, an enemy weekend. They would do weeks of uh, every, in the fall, and you could go see them. Like, because we would 
we would go to the library and look at Village Voice and just drool over the gigs. Like, oh man, Railroad Jerk's playing or Roberta Magus is playing. Like, those are so cool. So we eventually just went when they were having a week of gigs and just checked out gigs nonstop and it was amazing. Uh, but the last one we saw was uh, the Static Peace Showcase with the Blue Humans and Thurston and William Hooker opened up and, and you know, we didn't know about free jazz or anything. Didn't even know about the Blue Humans. So we were so inspired uh, driving back that night that we were like, let's start a label where we just do drums and guitar and weird shit and we'll hand made the covers. So I think we did like 30 of those. Um, and uh, Jeff did a lot of solo guitar stuff and the, the covers were hand collaged. Everything was handwritten. Uh, but we didn't have anyone to sell them to or not even sell them to give them to. We sent them to Force Exposure and some other people. But it was kind of a dead end. And then uh, me and Jeff were living at a place in Kalamazoo, just up the street from here, uh, where we did all that. And we played, we had a band with Ramirez called Plants. His girlfriend at the time would go to sleep at 10. So his girlfriend at the time was a, a really cool lady named Libby. So he would drive over and we would do gravity bongs. You know those? Yeah. yeah. We, we got a construction cone that was like four, <laughs> four feet tall. And uh, we had the best weed imaginable. And we would do two hits of the gravity bongs each. And, you know, we would do these and you would pretty much black out for like 10 seconds. You would, you'd have to have, we would do it. It was a ritual. We would do it and we would, you'd have to grab the dude. Like I had so many times I had to grab Ramirez and wake him back up because it was just unreal. And then we would record a C90 uh, in the rocket room and Ramirez would play a uh, shitty keyboard like a real you know not a non-synth keyboard from the other room and I would either play saxophone electronics or drums and Jeff would play guitar we we do that Monday through Friday uh, and then we would listen to the tape so it was like you know from 10 to 1 in the morning Monday through Friday it was amazing it was like second nature that's you know how we went to sleep Blackout and, uh, sessions. <laughs> yeah yeah so Brian uh, was always, you know, he was, uh, you know, he's like a folk guy. He likes, no, he likes normal music, you know. Um, he's a songwriter guy, and uh, he try, he did a couple of solo tapes of songs and just weird, you know, weirder stuff. And he, I think he did like five of those, and he would get drunk and he would walk them over and knock on the door at like four in the morning, and be like, "I made another tape, man," you know, and. Uh, that was cool, but it was like really kind of like song stuff, you know? So we decided uh, that we were going to cover uh, Jesse Harper's Guitar Absolution in the Shade of the Midnight Sun. So we, we covered that top to bottom, and then we met Gretchen, and she came into the fold, and that's how UI started. And then when we moved uh, just a couple of houses down uh, to a house that was only $300 a month, it was like, a secret house that just kept passing from crew people to crew people because it was an elderly woman that didn't know prices went up, you know? So the house never got like fully cleaned. It just kept moving, you know? So we finally got it for 300 bucks a month. It was a beautiful house, huge. We'd have crazy parties there, yada, yada. So that's when um, I was working at Kinko's and I've, I've got a bunch of uh, envelopes that Kinko's was throwing out and that's how uh, the first 10 uh, American tapes started, minus the Daylight Savings Time uh, zine that was number one. Okay. So that was, that was the kind of birth of it. And Eric Cook, who was in Baton Rooster and Gravatar, was my good friend at that time. We were in a band called Zero Percent Interest. We tried to get signed to Gross, and uh, a homeboy, Al, wrote back, said, your band holds zero percent interest to me. And we were just like, oh, man, that's so cool. Um, uh, that's awesome. and, and, he's, uh, he's got a rap, hasn't he, as, of having been a bit cranky as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But his first, uh, his first American gig was in uh, the Marshall Street basement where we lived with uh, Dillaway and everything okay. like that. That was, that was a crazy gig. Um, so anyway, that, that's how that, and then that phase of American Tapes started. Um, and me and Jeff were not friends at that point. Uh, we're friends now, but you know, we're living together, young cats, yada, yada. Um, so that was kind of the birth of that. And that was when I was dealing with Anomalous Records a ton. 
uh, he Eric was you know the only guy doing that grabbing weird homemade tapes so we had a good relationship and that kind of gave me a reason to do it and I would uh, you know just send uh, anyone uh, a copy of the tapes you know and it wasn't until like American tapes like I don't know 30 or 40 where Gretchen was like because I would I would make 10 and send 10 away I wouldn't wouldn't keep one she was like yeah. you should be keeping one so um, yeah a lot of the early ones I didn't keep a lot of the I mean the majority of the people were cool um, but there was I remember a tracks morgue that dude was a nightmare <laughs> He uh, he was like your shit sucks. You should stop. Um, <laughs> he was really bad. Just press and, one key uh, on your MS twenty and hold it down for an hour. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't very nice. A lot of the A band dudes weren't very nice. Neil Campbell was nice, but there was a a couple of guys that had tape labels that weren't very nice. Um, uh, but you know, majority everyone was cool. You know, um, it was great. Getting bad stuff, you know, it wasn't a problem. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess like it's not. If you get constructive feedback, it's it's not you know it's kind of useful because at least then you can kind of think, well, yeah, I could tweak this or that. But yeah. I remember talking to you. I don't know how long it was, a few years ago, and, and it was in Rough Trade. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And you were doing like a a sax gig and some readings, and we were talking afterwards about what we'd be working on, and I told you, oh, I'm doing this, trying to do a cover, like a tape cover for a split tape with K2 and, a, and another guy, a Japanese guy called Yasuhito Fujinami. And it was, uh -huh. Yasuhito had asked me to do the tape. Uh -huh. And I got this email and I'd sent them this thing. And, you know, I thought it was really cool. Like the, the tape was called like Split Persona or something like that. Uh -huh. And I'd done this collage and I found this really cool picture of a, <clears throat> like a Buddhist statue where its head was split open so there was a second head inside it and I was like oh that's yeah. cool you know like it's probably a bit forced you uh -huh. know but I, I sent it over and I get this email back and uh and the guy's really apologetic he's like I'm really sorry but K2 hates it <laughs> <laughs> he's like it's absolute bullshit uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to change it and I was like oh, fuck man you know what am I gonna do and it, um, and it was it was supposed to be on Kinky Music Inst Institute. No, no, it was on this this other guy's label. He was okay. releasing it himself. But all right, I remember you you saying to me, "Yeah, like I dealt with him, and he gave you some harsh feedback or something in the past." But eventually, I ended up like doing a second cover. Like I just went, "Oh fuck it!" You know? Oh no, he said to me, "Oh, can I use this one?" And I went, uh -huh. "Okay, yeah." And I like photoshopped it onto a tape template, I sent it to him, and he paid me for two of them. Oh wow! But he never he only used one of them, and I felt really bad about it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the um, I don't know if you remember, but the full K two story was um, he, I was dealing with him because he was one of my favorites uh, from early on, and uh, he asked me to put out a tape, and I sent him something, and uh, he he sent me a letter back being like, I don't like this, I'm not going to put the tape out, and it <laughs> devastated me, and I was like, oh my god, what can I do? Um, <laughs> And, and Gretchen was like, uh, how about you tell him that you sent him the wrong tape? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Foolproof. shit. <laughs> What's that? Foolproof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I sent him another package being like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, uh, that was meant for this label. Uh, here's the new one. It was Race Enamel 3 or whatever the fuck. And he was like, yes, I like this. This is what I wanted. You know, I was like, <laughs> I was like oh, yeah, man, cool. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> You should have told him you'd sent the other tape to Gross or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 man. Um, I mean, Gross was, I just, uh, Gross was the best, man, you know? Yeah, there's was, some awesome, there's really nice, like, nice packaging and stuff on all those tapes. Yeah, and Even the whole, the, like, you know, metal, the first 50 were on metal tapes, mm. you know? Um, I mean, the density comp was incredible, you know? Um, yeah. The aqua stuff was incredible i mean he was it was really exciting stuff you know um, yeah definitely the peak of japanese noise for me you mon, know mon brut and stuff like that oh it's great that uh the purgatory tape and even the third organ stuff yeah i mean that that still has a vibe i haven't listened to it in a while but uh the red nine sextet one uh from homie uh from slug who lived in michigan uh it's, it's just great man you know, that yeah. was really, really inspiring label. But yeah. I, when I was in Japan, I found a bunch of stuff. 
like I found some uh, I don't know if I found like an incapacitance gross tape I can't remember which one that is it's a chamber of thermonosis or something like that and, uh-huh. and a bunch of other stuff and a bunch of basket t- case tapes <laughs> in in Tokyo of all places uh, like four or five of them in, it just all in a row it can't be that can't be like basket case tapes are they? um yeah that that uh um yeah, I had a lot of history with the Gravatar dudes because um, that basket case was with uh, Jeff from uh, Gravatar. Yeah. You know? and me, me and Eric worked a bunch and I still see uh, Mike uh, in Marquette, which is a super small town up up north in the UP. Um, but Lisa, basket case was uh, Jeff and Lisa. They were dating at the time. They were a, a long couple and uh, uh, she, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, the place called the Cade in Detroit, but she lived at uh, like an apartment above the um, right. an, an art gallery museum that was, you know, just starting up. And we convinced the dude to have gigs there. Um, and that was, uh, we had a big 4th of July gig with No Neck and Sunburn and all that stuff. It was like an all day affair. It was a lot of fun. UI played. And, um, and that was when uh, Nate was in UI and all that stuff. So it was it was a really good era and we would just practice in the, the gallery uh, as many times a week as we could. It was a really fun band, but cool. Neil, Neil Campbell was just like, Oh, basket case, man. Like you should, uh, you should co- entitle one of your tapes stomach rot or something stupid. Like that. <laughs> I just entitled it that, you know, in terms of Neil, cause you know, we spent a lot of time with him back in the day. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Was he over in the States a lot or something? Or? Yeah. Yeah. He came for, uh, he came for our wedding and we did a tour oh, wow. around that. And he actually got nude and played um, for the, our after party. You know, when we had a bunch of parents there and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, shaking bells completely naked. You know? <laughs> oh, man. He, yeah. uh, you know him very well? Uh, no, I've not met him. Um, I was at, so I went to see them play, like, by the Cathedral Orchestra. And, All right. Uh, at Cafe Otto, you know, like okay. you guys played there a couple of yeah, times, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the, the poser place, obviously, but it's like <laughs> the only place in town that hasn't shut down. So, um, they're still doing gigs, not right now. I think they're gonna start again, but like they're the only place that does, you know, like sort of experimental noise stuff that hasn't shut in the last oh, wow. yeah. 10 years, really. So, they've kind of cornered that market, but also in a way where it's like you're not gonna go in there and get the shit kicked out of you, which is. <laughs> <laughs> it takes the edge off but you know yeah, it's fair. yeah we all we always try to get neil to play with us at cafe auto and uh and uh what's his name is always like oh man they play here too much you gotta pick someone else like they're always <laughs> here <laughs> harsh yeah um uh, but yeah we we spent we did a lot of stuff in the states with him and sticky foster i don't know if you know him as well but yeah well re- not, not personally really, just the really music. cool guys yeah um, Super cool. cool. Um, but you know, bet the UK scene early on, um, it was a destroy all music uh, labels, and um, you know, Belly welcomes careful drivers. I mean, all that stuff was great. You know, and uh, face like a smack darse and all that <laughs> stuff. You know, yeah, it was really cool. You know, so there was a lot of a lot of stuff dealing with the UK people back in the day. Yeah. Then you'll pretty uh, gay, chocolate monk, all that stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, was you mentioned MSBR mm-hmm. earlier? So you did like Tano forever, like obviously the, oh, yeah. the split with. Is it, no, it's a collab, right? It's not split with MSBR. It's a, it was a live gig. Um, okay, is it? Yeah. So was it from the time when they were over, and there was like the Detroit workshop thing going yeah. on, like ninety yeah. nine? Yeah. So you yeah. recorded a, a show together or something? We picked them up um, at the at Nihilus Spasm Band's gallery in uh, London, Ontario, which is like, I don't know, three hours from here or something like that. And we had to drive them back to Detroit because they did the noise workshop at the Record Collector. Yeah. Uh, they did two gigs and then they did Grand Rapids. And Grand Rapids, I met them at and we did that gig. And it was like a Monday and there was... I think maybe one paying customer, a huge club, you know? Wow. Um, so 
Yeah, it was crazy. It was him and uh, Government Alpha, MSBR, and, and, and myself. Yeah. And, uh, but, I mean, you know, I can't say enough about Tano, man. Like, he was the first website I ever saw, like, super inspiring guy, you know. And his sets were so good. And they st- I think the records are still great, you know. Packaging aside, the music was incredible, you know. Yeah, yeah. A hundred percent. And he, he was just – he was it for me, you know. And, and when he passed, it, that was – kind of the the end of that era you know yeah that it it was so inspiring you know and the stuff he did with small cruel party and uh daniel mench and all that stuff it was just such a good era yeah 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 that tina forever set is is (laughs) awesome is it the whole gig because like one side is it's kind of like all you need you don't need a flip side it's just 15 minutes (laughs) that's a good point because you know uh, people always sweat us uh, about one-siders <laughs> and uh, you know um, in, in Michigan the Michigan style was a gig was a 15 to 20 minute less than 20 minute experience you know so it was the closest thing to to being a, a gig you know and um, I don't know how many records you have but rarely do I play both unless you know i'm checking them out first off yeah. like i listen to side by side by side you know it's such a it's such a weird experience to change the side of the record you know it's almost like you're rebooting it <laughs> scratch you know yeah. so it's that was the idea of the the one-siders you know and i had a i had a um <clears throat> not a contract but i had to deal with bill smith where he was like look man like how about I give you free colored vinyl and, um, you know, don't complain and I'll train people at the pressing plant. And when we have pressing issues, I'll use your projects to see if they're okay. So you'll be kind of like a a tester mule uh, for this pressing plant and just don't complain. And I'll let you, I'll bill you once a year and I'll give you this rate. And it was incredible. So there was a ton of records where I would send the master and what came back, I don't know what the fuck was going on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, which made it exciting. You know, like if there was a pressing issue or if it was more lo-fi than anything, it was like, bring it on, man. You know, like it added, <clears throat> it added to the excitement, you know? Yeah. And then it got to the point where it was like, all right, DJ dog, Dick and Typhus, like record without headphones and I'll send it to the plant and we'll both listen to it for the first time together, you know? And that was, that was super fun. You know, that was the coolest. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the pressing, the mystery of the pressing plant was as part of the thing, you know? So that was when he got bought out by oddly enough, third man, that was the end of that. I had no more uh, American press uh, that I could deal with. You know, that's why I'm glad we found this new one. But um, it got to the point where uh, semis would come up and deliver like four records at once. Like I remember they were like, all right, you, can you guys handle a crate at your apartment complex? We're like, what are you talking about? It was like, you guys are now doing freight mail. So you're going to need like a, um, a, a forklift or something to get this off. Then we're like, fuck, you know? So that, that was cool. You know, that was exciting. And um you know, he would bill me once a year. So I could, I could do a gig like the Dirty Dynamite Gang, uh, the LP with Spencer Ye and Jessica Ryland. We did a gig on Saturday at Gray's. I sent it off Monday morning and the finished product was there a week and a half later. You know, wow. it was just incredible, you know, and uh, it was a really good experience all around, you know. Seems like the perfect kind of way to do a DIY well, yeah. DIY and like home homemade label where it's like, <laughs> you know, well, if it's not experimental enough, it might come out even more weird after it's been yeah. a pressing plant, right? So, you know, the, and these cats are like talking about the fidelity issue and it's just like, dude, like <laughs> that's part of the thing, man. You know, that's, I, that's cool. You know, this is an 180 gram vinyl, yeah. virgin yeah. vinyl. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, not having to put the money up front for the project was amazing as well too you know so it was a we uh, you know we had that relationship for years you know so it was it was really cool 
and free yeah. colored vinyl so it's great you know and sometimes like squeezing something into you know where you've got a restriction like you've got 15 minutes yeah makes it's got to be like a challenge right like don't don't bother having like a 10 minute warm up solo you know yeah. this isn't fucking this isn't a gentle giant or something yeah. one side yeah flute intro and poetry whilst you're like building up to the jam at the end it's like well it was hey, like just you know, go turn it on and go yeah, absolutely i mean it was like michigan style like you're playing there really wasn't that many outsiders at the peak you're playing you know like nate came up with the um the term it was like secret society you know it was like we would get together on sundays and we would discuss the music and we would play for each other but there's no outsiders really no one would want to see this shit. So when you plugged in and played, it was an idea that you had working on the whole week. So you would get an idea for a performance and you would do it. So there was no warm up. People knew who you were. You didn't need you didn't need the rigmarole. You know, you're already part of the family language, which was harder to play in front of your peers than it was a room for people you didn't know, you know? Um right. So that added to the, uh, you know, aesthetic challenge that I think worked really well, you know, and people would be like, I didn't think that worked or I didn't like that or yada, yada. It was just 15 minutes, you know, you could, no one would ever do, people would rarely do two things, you know, you would have a DJ, you would have fun and then everyone took the gigs really serious and then that would, you'd go back to DJing again, you know, so it was, it was a really cool experience and there were so many houses the pleasure dome uh yada yada you know we had gigs in our apartment for just two people <clears throat> there was a time when me and conley and tara and uh, tova would just do gigs for each other which was really weird you know it's like wife swapping or something like that um Put your instruments in a bowl and the, <laughs> and the table and yeah. see what you get. Yeah, and it, it just got, it just, get, you know, it, it was really weird. Like the, the split we did with Haunting, the Dead Machines Haunting record, um, we were going to do the cover was my arm around Tara and Connolly's arm around Tova. And, and <laughs> when we did it, saw the pictures, it was just weird, man. Like we had to tap out on that. It was like, it was getting like way too personal, you know? So, yeah, yeah. um, <clears throat> And, and we didn't, the thing that really drove us crazy was that people, you know, got so worried about what their record's going to be. Oh, it's the record. Like, it needs to be perfect. Like, you know, it, it's this object. Like, we really, we, we, me and Conley made an agreement. We were like, we don't send anything to the plant that we're not worried about. Like, we were like, oh, I don't know if that should be sent to the plant. You know, like, ah, oh, shit, man. Like, fuck everything was white knuckled until you got it, you know? So that type of mentality got out of the preciousness of like, this needs to be like a finished, you know, edition of a thousand record, you know, you know, that put out once a year. Other people do that, but for us and our, you know, community, it was like the idea of pressing a record was just no different than a tape, sometimes even worse, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, um, and that and that added the mistakes and all the arbitrary things that gave it wings for the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? So would you, would you it, it was only a, it was only a hundred. So it was like they're here and gone before you can even worry about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Did uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if you know the label Very Good Records from Germany, Thomas Ekins label. Uh, no, I think I'm confusing a very friendly record. <laughs> Just not I was, it was like a punk guy in Germany that put out noise records. He put out Coits and he put out the Prick Decay record. Okay. And uh, he put out all these editions of 100. And the greatest record he did was uh, Pizza Go Go by Automatic. And it was, uh, it had a handmade cover. And it was, <clears throat> it, it was, it was just a recording of like a German party. It was like Germans at a party. <laughs> like, just like, you go to like a party and hit record, you can kind of hear some music in the background. There's no reason why it should be pressed at all. It makes no <laughs> sense. Um, <clears throat> it's not musical. It's not like a statement. And it's, and like when we got that back in the day, I think it was put out in like uh, 95 or something like that. Uh, uh, we were like, oh my God, this is like, 
this is the best record ever made. Like nothing can top this. So that was always the model being like, why, why the fuck would you press this? That those should always be the question. Like my God, you know? And then it got to the, you know, no state, no sound where it was just silence and just stupid shit. So it was like, you know, we had that. So it's might as well just fucking do it, man. You know what I'm saying? And then when <coughs> normal people, rockers would see it, they'd be like, give me a fucking break, man. Like, like, huh? You know? So it was, it was cool, you know? It was the perfect amount of idiosyncraticness mixed with, like, you know, local vernacular stuff, you know? Do you ever get any emails back saying, I think my record's messed up for the best oh, absolutely. statement of sound? Absolutely. And those are the best, you know? <laughs> um, Some angry dude, like, there's yeah. nothing on here. Well, I mean, no one, I mean, people, you know, people knew what they were getting at that point. Okay, you know? fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Did it seem but, weird, uh, though, to be doing you know, stuff where you're recording all these gigs and it's everyone local, but then it's a whole bunch of people, you know, from different countries or cities, like buying this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it was, it was cool, but it, you know, it just went back to the whole like old school tape trading thing, you know? Yeah. And, um, uh, the, the thing that also was good about the vinyl thing, which really, I find disappointing and like the fag tapes and all these labels that didn't make the vinyl jump is that, you know, when you just are a tape label or just this, just that it, it's, it's limiting in itself. And if you can't take your aesthetic or your sound to vinyl and not have it be a big change, like this is my big vinyl release or something like that. Like we wanted it to always be the same style throughout the format, you know, to not not have that that differentiate you know that biting your knuckles feeling about pressing records which is kind of hard to get at because you know like when we did the first ui gravatar record it was very much like oh my god we're doing a record you know it was like too tense or too strident and stuff like that hmm. so the the connection we had with bill smith that deal made that a lot easier you know but it took a while to get to that point you know like you can be doing tapes and all the stuff, but when it's time to do wax, it's a whole different thing. But the problem is you shouldn't think that it's a whole different thing, you know, but that's, that's, again, that's just personally my, my take on the whole thing, you know. But is it, do you think it's too expensive now to do like, to have that same mentality that with like wax? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, because of, uh, you know, third man and people buying plants, it, the, you know, it's like a two year wait now, you know, yeah. But this, this new connection we got, it's amazing, you know, right back on it, you know, it's yeah. like cuts, but actual records, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like so it's, it's cool. It's exciting. Cool. Uh, all right. I don't want to leave you like hanging on here too long, man. No, I want no, to give you some of your time back. It's all good, man. All good. Uh, I was going to ask you like, so I think last year you guys, uh, I think Nate put out a mix for was it fact magazine or something something like that self-titled magazine anyway. all right yeah uh and there was a couple of tracks on there with marshall allen oh yeah so is that something like is that a release that you guys have got coming out or was that we, like we, uh, <laughs> we tried um we tried to contact the sunrock camp to put it out um and they they shut it down um so sadly uh it may never come out unless it unless it gets bootlegged at some certain time um <laughs> that sucks uh, was it yeah. a, was it a jam or did you do it like you know you know through the mail or something like no that? no no we did uh we did a gig in philly i uh, actually just wrote about it in the wolf doc um, okay uh it was a fantastic gig we played with the pyramids um from Chicago as well. And uh, it was, it, you know, it was just me, Nate, Marshall. <laughs> it was, it was fucking nuts, man. Like yeah. it started with Nate doing, uh, you know, some vocals and uh, Marshall playing the keyboard, the Sun Ra, like the little Casio. Yeah, thing. yeah. And then, you know, he plays alto and it's, you know, he hits that thing and, and you know, it was, it was fucking amazing. Danny, last time I saw Danny Thompson alive was that gig. Um, it was incredible. I hope it comes out. It's yeah. It, it the recording's great and it turned out really, really, really good. Um, so you know, hopefully it'll it'll come out. You know, I was nervous 
as all shit because I, I didn't want to play alto. Uh, so I was like, oh, I'll bring a homemade thing in the soprano. And that <clears throat> that ended up being a good decision because I didn't I didn't want to play tenor and I didn't want to play alto, you know. So, yeah. Um, but it was it was fantastic. He He's the great, you know, he's amazing. You, know? you don't want to go toe to toe with them, I guess. It could oh, be Jesus Christ. Could be tricky. Yeah. I mean, he yeah, hits that yeah. sound, man. He hits that sunrise sound and it's like just makes your hair stand on end, man. You know, that his alto, he, he's got sounds on alto that no one can get, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, he's really open-minded, amazing dude, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I hope it comes out, you know? Yeah. We, uh, at, and when they played Trip Metal Fest, when, when him and Danny played with Hieroglyphic Being, uh, me and Sam Tarpit had to take him to dinner before the gig so they wanted barbecue so we took them to a barbecue place in Detroit that had a gig <clears throat> starting while we were there and they were like saying hi to the uh, <laughs> the band like they were like flirting with the waitresses like <laughs> it was just a full on experience because uh, um, Jamal was with them too and uh, you know they were like as soon as a band came in, they were like, hey, what's up? Like, the yada, yada, talking and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, they're flirting with the waitress and all this stuff. And then when I go to pay, I'm like, I'm like, hey, you know that that's, uh, that's the Sun Rock guys. And she's just like, honey, I don't, I could give less of a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone comes through here. Like, who gives a shit? You know, I'm just like, all right, man, like, later. You know? it was, that, was, that, was, that was a crazy experience. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that comes out because the the track sounded really cool and and obviously, yeah, Mar Thanks. Marshall's a have, legend. Have you heard a lot of hieroglyphic being stuff? Uh, I was at that gig you guys did with him. Um, oh in, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, was like around the corner from that sort of weird industrial place. So you, yeah, yeah, that place was great. A uh, Highland Studios or something like that. New River Studios. New River Studios. Yeah, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a rehearsal room with a bar or something. So you you know you know our friend James Batty then, right? No. Uh, he, yeah, he's a, a British guy, a friend of ours. Has he went there? Help, help, uh, you've met him a lot of times. He's got like curly hair, like like usually wearing like, uh, usually he's got like a crust band back patch on or something like that. <laughs> but he's like pretty, Maybe. like nine to five guy. He's he's cool. You you recognize him if you saw him, but um. We, we ended a tour once at an after party there and we took <laughs> ecstasy that was in the Trump. I don't know if you ever saw them, but they look like vitamins, but they're uh, shaped like Trump. Okay. I've never seen any of those. <laughs> they were big like two, two three, <laughs> or four years ago. And we, we took those and, at New River Studios and we were just, I mean, Batty, like we had to pick him up off the street. Like he couldn't <laughs> deal with it, but it was, God, it was so much fun. And there was like a, a baritone player that was playing solo. Uh, yeah, New New River Studios is great. Super you fun. You didn't go running around the rest of the area, though, surely? Uh, probably. <laughs> it's, it's probably not, it's not a place to get lost late at night. Yeah. Let's yeah. just take a lot of ecstasy. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, but, you know, me and, me and Nate are tall dudes. We, we can handle we can handle our stuff, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I'll give it a pass. <laughs> but the venue's cool they have some really good stuff on and it, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of much more like kind of grungy kind of noise venue type place than than cafe otto obviously it's like the yeah, opposite yeah. end of the scale you know yeah it's a it's a different style it's yeah. cool yeah and there's not many of them left a lot of them are shut down unfortunately right? yeah it's what a bummer man yeah i mean you know we we've talked to me and nate have talked about the fact that there just might not be gigs you know for a really long time you know we're 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 working on a future that doesn't depend on gigs, you know, which is fucking weird. You know? Second life. Yeah. Second life. <laughs> but it's definitely not like, you know, a gig on zoom is not, not intense, man. You know? No, <clears throat> I watched a couple just cause you know, got nothing else to do. Right. Like, fuck <laughs> it. I may as well. And, and they, but they're all right. But yeah, you like the atmosphere, but yeah. the plus side is, there's no tall dude standing in front of me. So I can see yeah, the whole guess, thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's always good when you're uh, That's a good that's a good plus. Yeah. yeah. When you're not a, a, a tall chap, you know, like stand, <laughs> stuck at the back. It's definitely a bonus. <laughs> Obviously the other week somebody tweeted David Crosby 
and asked him what he thought of wolf eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and he was less than complimentary. So what do you think of David Crosby? I don't, I don't know if that's, I mean, is that his actual account? I have no idea, to be honest. It could be anybody. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard like it is and it isn't. I heard yeah. that it might be Twig. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I, I assume that it isn't, you know? Um, You'd think David Crosby's management would sue if it wasn't, right? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would assume that that dude probably has better things to do than fuck around on twitter you know what i'm saying uh, to everybody's thing you know i don't know man is he <laughs> i i don't know i don't know but you know it's music i mean jesus christ man there's nothing worse than uh all the old punk dudes and all the old noise dudes that like started playing guitar and then they think neil young's like the end of all music you know so they suddenly go from being like wild 20 year olds to like 90 year olds overnight you know what i'm saying like that, uh, I just, yeah. Um, Neil Young's cool, you know, but it's like people that think that that's the end, man, you know, whatever. Especially Crosby, still Nash and Young, good harmonies, you know. It's like shit my mom listens to, you know. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's shit my dad listens to. He's always, yeah. like, think, he's exactly the same thing. Oh, but the great harmonies, like, yeah, but yeah. it's boring. It's kind of twee and it's like, yeah. It's the kind yeah. of thing you hear in a like non-offensive cafe or something. And it's and it's like you know so so lightly political. I don't know, I don't know. You know whatever. It has its thing. You know if you want to listen to folk music, you know whatever. I mean the UK folk music's incredible. You know it's got way more stuff. You know it's got a West Coast thing going on. But whatever, man. Like I don't think I've I've had a Crosby record. You know whatever that that one that like i don't know if it was my name or whatever the blurry one that has his yeah silhouette on i guess that one's all right but you know whatever man you know it's wow. west coast music you know i'm from the midwest man you know not not to it, go back to, to the it. point you know <laughs> there is not no to, heaven <laughs> you not know? to go back to neil young but like zuma just needs to cut that csn y track off the end Oh my God. That yeah. And that's sucks. another thing about Neil Young. He always has a song that gets you out of the zone. Every man needs a name made. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. You know, it, it'll be really good. What's the crappy one on, on the beach that sucks? Uh, um, I can't remember. I haven't listened to that one for ages. Yeah. Um, yo, uh, I think it's revolution blues or it's okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of those. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And it's just weird, man. Like, I don't know. You know, you, why listen to Neil Young when you got the Necros, you know, or the fucking Pagans or like some, some Midwestern or the Stooges, you know, listen to the fucking Stooges, you know, listen to something that's legitimately destroyed, you know, it's, it's, you know, it has its place. People are stoked on it, but whatever, man, you know, tomorrow's going to be gray. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't. You can still put the stages on, and it still sounds fresh. Like, oh, sh still yeah. kicks. Yeah, it's insane. You know, they did it all. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, mid Midwest music. You know, not not fucking David Crosby. Whatever, <laughs> man. You know. So how long I, are you? You you're gonna keep doing the podcast for a while? The yeah yeah we're uh we just did one with Seeger's <laughs> tour. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna be got, kind of interesting. I haven't heard it yet, but I imagine uh, he's got some tales. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely old school, man. He definitely likes chicks. <laughs> um, we got uh, on Friday. We're interviewing um, a really weird Michigan noise rock band called Caustic Frequency something. Uh, I found a seven inch by him and I tracked him down. So we're gonna we're gonna interview them, uh, but. You know, uh, we're starting to run out of people to, to, <laughs> that want to interview us. So <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how long it goes, you know. Um, but it's cool. The rich guy is a journalist, and, you know, Tove is a journalist. So I, I get along with journalists really good. You know, I like them a lot. Um, so it's, it's a good relationship, you know. So it's fun, you know. I guess they give you an idea how to structure it an actual like conversation or an yeah. easier like yeah well i mean journalists are really good conversationalists they should be in general you know so but i've always i've always gotten along with journalists a lot you know it's the majority of tova's friends and 
our friends and stuff like that. So it's the Gemini in me that likes it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so you, other than that and the, the book, have you got anything else lined up? Or uh, no, I mean, we got the, we got the seven inches coming out and we got the, the library thing that um, I don't, I mean, it, it's cool working this stuff without uh, a deadline. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be, that'll be going on. But um, yeah, I mean, without gigs, we're trying to do a new future, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of tracks exchanging through the mail and stuff like that. So that, that's been cool. Um, but it's just, it's just weird, man. It's just, you know, it's so gnarly out. It's just not really entertainment time, you know, with everything that's going on, especially in the States, you know, yeah, so, yeah. as you much know, as, the, as much as we want to go to a gig, it would also be kind of weird, you know, cause you've been indoors for six months to then be surrounded by people. Yeah. Be... Well, you also don't want to be the first person to have a gig to be that person, you know, where <laughs> a bunch of stuff comes about. So it's just, I don't know, man, you know, there's a time to hang back and and take a a moral inventory and look at your history. So that's that's what seems to be the right time right now. You know, as adult as that sounds. Yeah, that's cool. Though. It gives you time to like look back on what you've done because yeah, there's definitely an element of when you're like creating stuff to just always be like, I've got to do something new. I've got to like yeah work on this thing that I started rather than <laughs> actually looking back and going, oh, this stuff was pretty cool actually. Like maybe I should do more of that or yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, and the, you know, the fam's always here too. So the, the amount of free time you think you have sometimes isn't necessarily uh, true when you've got just a small window. Cause I, I don't know if you work well, but I, if you work like this, but you know, when you have smaller parameters, you seem to work better rather than, you know, things that seem to be, you know, endless. So. Yeah. I don't like open parameters. Like if somebody <laughs> said like, if I've done, I've done covers for people like for albums and stuff. And if, and if, if you say to them, so what, what kind of thing do you, you know, do you want? Like, or what's, what's the title or anything? And they go, I'll oh, just do what you like. like. Yeah, but you might not like that. Or I've got like <laughs> no yardstick to work with here. Like, just tell me something. At least tell me something that, that I have done that you like. So that yeah. I know I could maybe do something similar to that rather than just <laughs> do what you like. Like it's blank canvas syndrome. You look at it and go, I have no fucking ideas. <laughs> Well, uh, have you have you found that you've been more productive during this period? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it goes in phases. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I've had like a blast of stuff, and then other times I've just you know just been chilling out and watching yeah. films or something, and just <clears throat> just listening to music. And I've had to like mix it up. So I used to do much more like everything was done by hand, like just all yeah. working with paper, but because I would print everything off in the office, right? Like they had a good quality, <laughs> they had a good quality printer. So I would go in and print like all my photos out that I'd taken in places yeah. and like get all the change all the sizes and then take them home. And I could like work with that. Yeah. Uh, I can't do that now. Cause I've just got, you know, some piece of shit, like 50 pound <laughs> printer type thing. And, <laughs> and like you, you think, oh, that will give it a really cool lo-fi aesthetic, but it just looks like shit. You know? <laughs> so I've I've had to start doing stuff like digitally. Um, oh yeah. With like just purely on on Photoshop, and it's it's different. Like it's good and bad. So if I want to like do something really specific, you know, like I've got a really intricate piece that I need to like remove. Mm -hmm. it's much harder to do it on a laptop than it is mm -hmm. by hand. But then I can also like blast through ideas really quickly, you know? So what I find is quite good with it is that if I've just got a couple of like random photos, I can start mixing stuff around quicker and yeah. that kind of, yeah. And it kind of sparks an idea faster sometimes. Mm, Cause sometimes if I was doing it by hand, like I'm trying to like force something. Whereas with a, you know, yeah. I try things and it fails and I try things and it fails and it, with a doing on like on the laptop, I can do it much faster. And then I might be like, okay, here, I've got four starter pieces and mm. I can do something with each of these. Yeah. And then, I, and then I'll dive into it deeper rather than trying to do everything at once. So, so before you would send the actual hard collage to the printer. No, I would like, again, scan them at work oh. on the good quality printer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then I would like, you know, clean it up maybe 
compile it all and then I would send uh-huh. it in. I, I yeah. wouldn't send them the originals just because they were all like random sizes and dimensions and stuff. And, you know, it comes out. I, I've done it like a bit more like that in the past and it kind of came back and looked like shit. So I thought <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it myself because I've they, got more control. Did they send you proof? No, I just, just wing it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah with mixed results but again like going back to what you said a while ago it's like if you with, the, with like the one side of the records if you spend too long trying to make it perfect yeah you're going to be disappointed yeah it's come back and i've actually looked at it and gone oh, it doesn't look good man like the one i did before where i yeah. didn't spend loads of time like adjusting all the levels or the colors like looked way better you know it just looked <laughs> it looked like natural whereas this one looks a bit like too strained yeah, exactly. It kind of took some life out of it or something. So yeah, yeah. Try yeah, not to do that too much. That's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Has the prices gone up for the printing? Yeah, they go up quite a lot over the time, oh, and uh, I'm fairly sure they hate me, but <laughs> but they're polite about it. So you uh-huh. know, we I go over that. <laughs> I mean, cool. I'm never rude. I'm always like, um, excuse me, this doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm British, so we're always like, um, this doesn't quite look the way I was hoping it was going to look. <laughs> or, or you sent me, or you sent me a box and like the bottom fell out of it and half the copies are missing. Could I maybe get the other half back, please? Like, st- that has happened. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure they think like, oh, it's that fucking guy again. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. No, I'm sure. I'm sure there's worse customers. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. I don't think I have any other questions yeah. lined up for you, man. Well, if you, if you think of anything else, or if you want to talk again, just you know, I'm totally cool. You know. Cool. I'm totally down. Yeah, we do, I do zooms all all the time. So <laughs> as I'm sure you do too. This is my like working day normally. Yeah. Zoom oh wait. Way. Okay, this is the last question because you mentioned right. it earlier and. I got two people ask me to ask you this. Do you still own a copy of every single thing in your discography? No, God, no. no, no. <laughs> You'd need like an extra house or something, right? No, well, it's just, it's too much because the, um, <clears throat> they're not glued. They're not the, I don't own the finished ones. It's the, it's the master art with the master tape. You right, know what right, I mean? right. So that it'll deteriorate or it'll be dubbed again. It's all, all it's in motion or not stored powerfully. Like I'm a horrible archivist, horrible. <laughs> it's, it's weird to have someone who can do good at both. You know what I'm saying? So no, God, no, no, not even close. Yeah. So it's more like a living thing rather than yeah. a, an archive the thing, in itself. The thing that me and Nate do have a lot of is uh, a lot of test presses. We got between the two of us, we got so many, uh, test presses and a lot of them are just white label and we don't even know what the fuck they are you know what I'm saying like so uh, the, the majority of the stuff we have is just a big crate of just test presses from you know plants that aren't even around or like you know what I'm saying like just weird stuff that doesn't can't fit here or there and you know Nate has a lot of test cuts uh, when he was cutting records a lot of weird that kind of stuff so it's a lot of a lot of one-off arbitrary stuff that wasn't finished or put into circulation, you know? Yeah. Um, Experiments. So, yeah. No, I, I, don't, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of weird. Like, I don't know how you would store all that. <laughs> and, and just master, just recording tapes and master tapes, like just tubs of those everywhere, man. You know, so much stuff has still not come out. And I just, I'm not a fan of the band. You know, I, you know, I got a band camp, whatever. But, uh, you know, people that lean on it with all this unreleased stuff, it's just, it just doesn't feel right now, you know? There's a certain amount, even, even writing the, the Wolf stuff, there's a certain amount of uh, uh, shoddy ground when you start looking back too much and start all this record, you know, you're still a living entity that's going forward. And, uh, you know, like the punk community, the punk underground and everything, so much is based upon the constant change of new uh, new things dying and new things being created so you're either in that stream where things are always dying and being created you know being created or you're looking back you know it's like two different mindsets so yeah. to be in between both worlds is kind of difficult you know but uh i prefer you know always moving forward you know because you know you don't pr- tomorrow's not promised to anyone man you know what i'm saying like 
it's like skating. Like I got to skate now because it's, you know, not too many more years ahead of me where I can, you know, so just get at it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason to wait, you know, any idea you have put it out, you know, for better, for worse, you know, it's like collages, you know, you're, you're, you're better off doing them, you know, than not, you know, so. I don't know, yeah. man, you haven't seen some of the rejected stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the rejected stuff's the good stuff, man. That's where it goes down. You know? Yeah, you gotta learn. You gotta have. You gotta make mistakes as well, right? Like that's <laughs> that's the learning curve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. thanks, man. I really appreciate yeah, man. you taking. Thanks the time. for the page. I'm glad it's you and not some fucking schmuck. <laughs> you're the you're the perfect dude for it, man. I I, I would trust no other. <laughs> thanks, man. Yeah. All right. Well, take it easy. Have a good yeah. day. Yeah, and we'll talk soon, man. Give All the right. best to uh, the uh, the missus. We'll do. All, All right. right see you, dude. All right. Bye. Bye.